Hi folks, welcome to the Tormach maintenance video. We're actually mostly done with the project, but I'm reshooting a lot of this footage to do a better job of explaining what we did. We replaced the whole spindle cartridge. We also did the belt here, the drawbar, the three or six um, Belleville washer, washers and a new R8 Master TTS call it. I'm super excited about that. That's gonna help. That's gonna get our tool changer back in action because it was our goof some time ago. I didn't talk about this on video where we screwed up our spindle with some flaws on the internal surface. And uh, I'm actually just excited to have a new spindle in it. Relatively inexpensive, super easy to do. We're replacing the way covers. There are, there are only three sets, the bottom of the Z and then the front and the back of the Y, just more, more a cosmetic thing than anything. Adjusting the Gibbs, that is a fun process where I learned a lot. Trying to get, just understand and measure accurately the backlash, as well as mess with the preload, especially on the X-axis uh, ball screw. And then finally checking the tramp. If you're interested in one of those specific things, look in the video description. There'll be the time to where you can jump forward, especially on the Gibbs. We learned a lot about uh, how to do that correctly and, and not correctly. Time out. We were editing this video and I realized we need to take a step back and explain uh, some basics about CNC and, and, you, and converting motors into accurate linear motion. So here's our Tormach table. We're gonna focus on the X axis. I think most folks uh, understand or are familiar with this picture. We've got a stepper motor on the left. It moves in steps or increments. There's a coupler and then that connects to the beginning of what is a ball screw. And there's a lot of technical terms here, but this ball screw is a pretty high quality ball screw and hardened and ground to a certain standard. And inside here, you can't see them, it's inside the whole uh, knee or uh, saddle here, is two ball nuts. And how those ball nuts are spaced together helps prevent any slop there, or the preload of the ball nuts themselves. And that is not user adjustable in these machines, but it should be you know, a couple of tenths at most. And it's not something we really should have to worry about. What do we want to happen? Well, we're all the way at X zero here. We've got a dial indicator zeroed. We want a few things. We want it, the machine, when we move all the way, say over to here and back, we want it to move along that path accurately. So every time we tell the machine to move 0.1 or 0.01 inches, we want that amount to happen and we want it to return back. And it's that change of direction that generally tends to induce backlash. We wanted to do so with this remaining as rigid as possible, but also as low friction as possible. One of the hardest things to do from a machine design standpoint, and it's one of the things that most people just say, that's backlash, but it's just that. If we hit one thou on our touchscreen path pilot here, and I go one tick to the right, that's the key thing. Our machine, you can see, we've got about half a thou or a thou a sort of lost motion, if you will, where we're telling it to move, but it's not moving just yet. So where does that come from, and is that okay? One thou is okay, I'm okay with that. How did we adjust that out? I used to think it had to do a lot with the Gibbs, and jump in in the comments below and tell me if you disagree, but the x-axis Gib runs along a plane like this, and really, when it's tightened down, it prevents the table from rotating like this. In other words, s twisting the table. It doesn't have a lot to do, frankly, with how the table moves accurately left to right. Now, if the gib is too tight, yes, and it's so tight that the motor can't even turn or stall, then yeah, you can lock the table in place. What we ended up adjusting and spending the most time on were the preload uh, nuts right here. And the best way I can describe it is the second nut just holds the first one in place. The first one pulls the whole ball screw taut. So if you think about it, anytime you mount a shaft uh, or a threaded rod in some assembly, yes, if you turn that rod, the, the ball screw nut will move along that. But what if the whole rod is shifting left to right? That's going to induce exactly what we saw there. And so tightening that nut down pulls that ball screw itself up against it so that here's what you want. Every time we move path pilot, that's gonna rotate. 
it's really not very hard to have a stepper that accurately rotates a certain amount such that this piece here turns the exact amount to move that corresponding linear motion. What's hard is to make sure the rest of the chain works and that was again part of it here. The other test is to go ahead and say G01X1, let's come way off that indicator and we're rapiding and then let's go back and let's see where we're at. And you can see, uh, I don't know, uh, I mean it's well under a thou, is it six tenths, seven tenths, eight tenths, I don't know. But at the end of the day, that's what matters. It's actually pretty easy and a smart machinist can cut more accurately than his machine by only going in one direction. But on CNC we're going back and forth a ton. So that ball, that um, backlash or lost motion, whatever you want to call it, you want to pay attention to it and I wish I had done this stuff sooner because it's actually not that hard to do and you at least want to know where you stand. There's more the complicated things that can go if it's you know severe maintenance problems if you have like a gib that wears out or other things that can happen but let me tell you we've used this Tormach over the last five years and the last two years pretty darn hard and it's been about three weeks since we actually filmed most of this maintenance footage that you're watching so we've had a chance to use the machine and folks it has totally, I'm so happy. It's really, I never lost faith in the Tormach, but let me tell you, it is cutting incredibly well. And to me, that's awesome because it tells me, hey, here's a five-year-old machine that's had some use. It's been moved around and it didn't take but a few hours of work. And this thing is just, it's cutting accurately and it's cutting with a fairly rigid cut. Uh, I love it. I'm super happy. So adjusting the gibs, we spent a lot of time messing around with this and here's what I learned. Here's how you can do this. The gib is a tapered piece of metal and as you wedge it further in, you're just increasing the tightness of the dovetail. It's that simple. And there are two screws. There's a screw on the big end of the gib and that pushes it in, which increases the tension. The small screw on the other end only has two purposes. That's to secure the gib in place once you've got it adjusted to where you like it. Uh, so it's supported on both ends. And if you've over tightened it, you need the small end screw to actually pop it back out. Here's how I suggest in a nutshell that you adjust the gibs. Take the small end screw out. Don't think where your gib is currently positioned means anything because for me, it's been years since I adjusted it. So it's not something where I think you should start from its current position as a reference point. What I did, I just drove that gib down until, as I'm jogging, until I seized the axis. And you can see here in this footage right here, the motor will stall out and you're not going to push it, especially if you only do it a few times here. And that tells you that gib is too tight. Now you back it off. Now when you back it off, you might need to put the small end screw in and actually tighten it up. Now you're actually locking it in a specific place and you've got a great place to start from. That's the key is you now know we need to back it off being seized and jog around a bunch. I actually had to back it up a couple of turns from where it's locked down to where I could get full motion and not have it seize up. That's a good way to start. Then you can do this lost motion test, which they describe in the manual and I don't, the idea is basically you make sure, I guess, that the stepper is not skipping steps, um, but I don't really like that. The other question is how do you know uh, that your gib is even in the right place to begin with. Well, we know that because we're, base, we're driving the gib in and seizing it up. But if you don't want to do that, then the question is, well, how do I even know? And I don't think the lost motion is a good way to figure that out. You can try to rock the table and play around with how tight it is because, again, in theory, if you pulled that gib all the way out or made it incredibly loose, the table would, you could literally move it around quite a bit. But I don't think there's an accurate way to, to, t to tell that, if that makes sense. So I would really suggest tighten it down and seize up the table and then back it out a little. If you guys have a better way to do that, please let me know, I'd welcome recommendations. When you're tightening the gib, you actually wanna try to jostle the table. It's a little bit hard to do with one person, um, but you, as you jostle that table, you can actually help secure that position of the gib um, and get a more consistent feel as you're going through and testing the fit. Tormach does have a good diagram in the manual which explains there is a sweet spot. If you over tighten the gib, you gain hardly any rigidity, but you significantly increase the wear or the strain on the machine or whatever. So I hate to say it, but there is that little sweet spot where 
It's just perfectly tight, not too loose, but as soon as you go a little too tight, you shoot up the uh, cliff in terms of diminished return. Now we're gonna play with the bearing preload. I had this situation where my y-axis would always move instantly when I jog in 1,000 increments. There was no backlash, at least that's what I think of as backlash, which means you're starting to rotate the screw, but the table isn't moving yet. Our y-axis was great. Our x-axis was not great. You could move it about 2,000 before an indicator would actually pick up movement on the table itself. So sorry, when you can move 2,000, say path pilot, but there's no motion yet. That to me again, backlash. So how do you adjust that out? And in talking to Tormach, there are three things that can be causing the symptom that we sort of have here. The first is what we just said, the preload on those two nuts, which you can adjust pretty easily as a user. The second is that the ball nut itself is, is worn out. I don't, it could be, that could be, but I don't think so. The, the third is that the ball nut carrier bolts that secure the ball nut in place have loosened. Very unlikely, I think Tormach said that those are uh, normally pinned in place, so it shouldn't be the case that that's the problem, especially since we're getting such small, re predictable, repeatable amounts. So here's some footage of us playing around with that. We haven't necessarily gotten it nailed down, but I want to make it clear that for me, this was an exercise of understanding and I wanted to do better, but the machine, as you saw in that accuracy test, I think still does a great job. And yes, if I can do better, I want to do better. But just because we haven't nailed this down doesn't mean I'm upset or I think that there's some big problem. I just kind of want to know. So we've got to get the machine back up in, prog back up in uh, production and we're going to see what it, how it works. And I think it will be a little bit better, but more to come on that. Um, it's also a great reason why we have the 440 now because it's nice to have a second machine. Adjusting the tram on the Tormach. So what is tram? Tram is basically whether your head is tilted in either along the X or the Y. And the great way that you guys might know is if you're using a tool like the Superfly that has a pretty long cut um, or pretty wide cutting radius, you'll see that it shouldn't be cutting on the back side. But if it is taking whisker hairs of material or more off, that means your head is tipped or tilted. I mean, that's, um, it's a relatively easy fix and it's something you should definitely pay attention to. It's somewhat counterintuitive to me how you adjust the tram. And we did a video on this uh, like a long time ago showing how you shim the base to adjust the tram. So check that video out, there's a link here. We just checked the tram on this machine, which we'll show you in a second, and it's, it's oddly spot on. And it really shouldn't be, given how often we've moved this and um, you know, the, how we've used the machine over five years. So I'm a little bit um, spooked that it's so on, to be honest with you. Uh, my buddy Brad over at Tactical Key Change also did a great video on showing it. He actually, I think, goofed on partway through it and, and, he, and he mentions that um, it wasn't as far off as I think he thought, um, but he did a great video with an even better way using a crowbar to check the motion. But there's two different tools you can do use to do this. Um, set up in the machine right here is something you probably already own, a dial indicator, along with this little arm to hold it. That's the less expensive way, but in my opinion, far inferior. What I really recommend is pick up one of these dual indicator things called the Edge Pro Tram. There's a link below. It's a hundred bucks, but it is well worth it because it gives you that instant feedback so much easier than using one indicator to sweep around. So first thing, calibrate the Edge Pro Tram. It's really simple. We're going to do is we're going to put the left one that has the knob that's harder to to get to rotate it over here and see we've got the magnet that comes with on and now don't move your table again and we'll use this mirror and if you look we'll just go down here and we'll set it on we'll jog so that it's on zero Okay, can you see? Can you see how that one's on zero? By the way, definitely buy a, a mirror for the shop. You'll be amazed at how helpful it is to have a mirror on a handle like this. So that indicator's on zero. Don't move your table. Don't do anything other than lift this plunger up, rotate the unit around, and 
Now what we need to do is turn the dial here, face, so that it's on zero, like so. So what we've done is set these two indicators to exactly the same height. Now, this whole Protran thing is great. You can build your own, and we may do that, and if we do, we'll put a link here to that project. Now you can lift your plunger up carefully, pull this magnet out of the way, and we're on the table here. Now that's a good question, is what do you tram? There's a, there's a good argument to tramming this off your vices, because at the end of the day, that's where you're doing your work, or fix your plate, or whatever. But we've got the mill sort of broken down to the bare table now, and I want to tram it there. Because if we change the tram when we add to it, then that probably means there's a problem in the fixture plate or the vices or the fixtures uh, and not the head itself. So I like going down to the core here. So we'll jog down. Doesn't matter really to where. We'll just get it so that one of them is on zero. Ten thousandths here. We'll put the left one on zero. And you see these are half thou ticks. So you see, I think that's six inches across. We are one thou off across six inches. Folks, that is nothing. That is, I am totally fine with that. Mind blowing. We got basically the same result when you turn it, uh, let's see if, it, if I'm over the table here or not. Yeah, we got, we got the same result when we turned it and checked the, the Y tram as well. So I almost wish it was off because then we would adjust it. But um, if we do have to adjust it, we'll do another video on just that. Or you can check out again Brad, the Tactical Keychains key chains video. So that's a wrap, folks, on our maintenance video. If you have questions, let me know. I really mean it. I will do this again if we can do it better. I will tear the machine apart again because... I know I want to understand this stuff better, how the ball nuts and the preload and the gibs all work and how the smart way is to do maintenance because at the end of the day, I don't think people mind doing maintenance. I think people don't want to chase their tails. They don't want to do something when they don't know if the outcome is predictable. In other words, they don't want to put time in unless time equals results. And that was my goal here is to try to break some of this down so that when you guys do maintenance, you know you're doing it right. You can do it in a concise period of time. And most importantly, you can get your machine back up and make an chips if not better chips so appreciate the support thumbs up commenting and sharing this video with your friends folks take care see you soon